everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And uh, I think before I, uh, I start, I want to thank the Rachel Carson Center for the incredible welcoming and the generosity of, uh, of the staff and of the people involved in the center. And I also want to thank my, my fellow fellows uh, who were incredibly uh, helpful um, during my stay at the, uh, at the Rachel Carson Center. So a big thank you goes out to everyone. So today I'm going to talk about the biopolitics of edible animal tissues. Um, and instead of calling it clean meat or laboratory meat or cultured meat or cell-based meat, whatever the, the name is nowadays, I'm going to call it edible tissues because, in fact, that's what they are. And the reason is that it's not really meat. Um, it, it, it really is a, a, a little slab of cells that are cultured together that are assembled to resemble meat or to look like meat and to taste like meat and to feel like meat. But at, at, at the basis of it, it's not really meat. And I'll get into that a little bit later. So <clears throat> as a sociologist of uh, science and technology, my interest is in asking questions about how society makes sense of new technologies, like edible tissues, for instance, and what they signify in terms of the social uh, order. What, what is this future that is projected in today's technologies? What, what, are we, what stories are we telling themselves, ourselves sorry, about the future um, in our technologies that we're creating, supposedly, for, for the future? And also, what, what importance uh, do we want to place on technological progress and into technology as savior in this particular time in our history, uh, in this time that we could qualify as the Anthropocene or whatever we want to call it. So the fact is that the idea of producing meat from stem cells, of, from the stem cells of animals, of live animals, plays also into the plasticity of life and its material redefinition in the laboratory. And so it comes out as a kind of a new form of vitality and one that is increasingly uh, more and more common and that is produced via biotechnologies and that become commodified. So they become objects that are sold and exchanged on, in the marketplace. Also, my perspective comes from my career as a molecular geneticist working in the pharmaceutical industry, having worked with plant tissue culture and cell animal cell tissue culture. And, um, you know, and so that, for me, raises a lot of ethical issues about eating these things, first of all. And also, at the time when I was working with these animal uh, tissue cultures, I had never even thought that one day we would be thinking about eating them. So that's where the, uh, the interest comes from. <clears throat> So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to show you a series of slides that I'm just going to rifle through because I'm doing the thing you should never do, which is put a lot of words on slides, but sorry. Uh, so <clears throat> I just want to show and convey through these slides that the idea of growing body parts out of the body is not a new idea. Uh, it started in 1912 with uh, Alexis Carrel, who was a cardiologist, and who did experiments with um, embryonic chicken hearts. And he came up with a theory of cellular immortality, which actually started this whole thing as a possible way to go. In his case, he was concerned about transplantation, but it sort of sparked the idea of, uh, of other people. So this is what, in the realm of what I would call techno-scientific imaginaries, in the sense that uh, ideas become realized over time, when scientists and the wider culture, the wider society sort of exchange ideas. So it's these ideas that transcend the laboratory get into the, the sort of the cultural realm and then make their way back into the laboratory. So the, the one uh, quotation that is always uh, cited is the one by Winston, Winston Churchill in his 1931 essay called uh, 50 Years Hence. And in fact, at the Biotopia exhibit this, um, this weekend, it was, it was in big, big letters at the uh, meet, the new meet uh, exhibit. Uh, and the, the quotation is, um, I took the longer version, it says, with a greater knowledge of what are called hormones, chemical messengers in our blood, it will be possible to control growth. We shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or the wing 
by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. So this was in 1931. I have to say, Churchill was a big uh, meat eater. Uh, 1943, the French uh, science fiction writer René Barjavel wrote a science fiction book uh, called Ravage, or Ashes to Ashes in English, where he describes the production of in vitro meat in a restaurant. So just, just very briefly again, uh, the last two uh, main uh, developments of this evolution of this idea, in the 1950s, uh, a scientist, a doctor came, uh, named Willem Frederick van Elen, uh, develops the idea of growing meat tissues outside of the animals. He's known as the godfather of cultured meat. He's not the good godfather of soul, but almost. Uh, <laughs> and he pioneered uh, the first uh, cultured meat patent in 1997, even though it wasn't realizable uh, at his time, but he, he patented the idea which is the industrial production of meat from in vitro cell culture, where he imagined growing stem cells from live uh, donor animals on scaffolds, so to, re to sort of replicate what uh, normal tissues would look like. As it turns out, this patent was very important because when he died in 2005, one of these startup biotech companies uh, entered into an agreement with his daughter to take over the patent. Uh, <clears throat> so what inspired Frederick uh, Van Elen or Willem Van Elen was the fact that he was a prisoner of war in Indonesia, he's Dutch, uh, and he starved to death. Uh, and he, well, not to death, obviously. <laughs> he starved. Um, and he, uh, he also witnessed how uh, Japanese soldiers were treating animals, and he felt very badly about this. And he himself felt like he was kind of you know, brought down to the level of an animal. And so he swore to himself while he was in that camp that he would never, or he would figure out a way to actually produce uh, meat without animal suffering. Uh, he also was a very big meat eater, so the, the idea of becoming a vegetarian didn't really enter his, um, his mind. <laughs> would have been easier, but you know, anyway. Uh, when he became a medical doctor after the war, he witnessed one of the first experiments in stem cell tissue culture that was aimed for a transplant of burn victims to so skin cells which are actually among the easiest uh, to, to, uh, to, to culture. And he told his daughter later on that when he was witnessing this particular experiment, all he could see was meat. And so that's where the idea really came from. And then finally in 1996, the Tissue Culture and Art Project uh, decided that they would come up with an exhibit that would show the um, the kind of the, the anxieties that uh, people feel about corporate biotechnology, in particular in terms of eugenics. Um, and so they created this exhibit called the Semi-Living Worry Dolls, where they created a kind of scaffold made of collagen, and they grew cells, um, stem cells, on this, giving rise to, um, oh, let me see if I can use my pointer. Yeah, to these little, this is a real worry doll here, and this is the, the stem cell tissue worry dolls. And of course, worry dolls, the idea is that the doll worries for you, so you don't have to worry. So in that sense, you don't have to worry about biotech or eugenics. The doll will do it for you. <laughs> so uh, very quickly, once again, 2002, NASA, very interested in these projects. One of the issues about stem cell um, edible tissues is the fact that nobody wants to fund it. Nobody wants to fund the research. They think it's a too far out idea. And so Van Elen is having a lot of problems getting this project off the ground. Uh, in, on the medical side, people are very interested in transplantation. They're very interested in the possibilities of growing human organs outside the body, but not so much in terms of food. And there, there's probably a, a good reason why that is. So 2002, they managed to get the interest of NASA. Uh, NASA funded a study for in vitro cell um, muscle protein production system, excuse me, for space travel, for long, long distance space travel. So they, they managed to get some decent results from these studies, but they didn't keep them up. Um, so they, what they did was they cultured the flesh from a goldfish, and they were able to maintain the goldfish flesh for quite a long time uh, by changing the culture medium and figuring out how it grows. They also fried the goldfish um, flesh that they were able to grow, and it, they said that it actually tasted like fish fillets. So this was hopeful for them. However, they didn't pursue that project. 2004, uh, a new harvest uh, nonprofit organization was funded. 
to actually fund and accelerate uh, commercialization of cultured meat. Uh, and then 2008, the first in vitro meat symposium in Os, I think it's pronounced, Norway, um, which actually brings together for the first time uh, scientists and investors in order to see the possibilities that uh, stem cell uh, tissue culture meats uh, might offer. And after that, of course, 2013, you probably all saw the pictures of the first taste test of the first hamburger created via a stem cell culture uh, by the laboratory of Dr. Mark Post, and it's called the Post Burger. It's not a joke. Uh, and uh, it was a big event uh, created with famous chefs and famous food critics, and it was kind of a proof of concept uh, demonstration to show that this was actually coming and that people should start to be thinking about the future possibilities that this technology offered. Um, so let me very quickly run through what, um, what in vitro meat is. Oh. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, it's, uh, it's a description of the way that in which animal stem cells are regenerated and grown into, grown into muscle tissue. So it's actually the, conver the convergence sorry, of many technologies, so mostly from the biomedical side, so regenerative um, medicine, tissue culture engineering, synthetic biology, and of course uh, all kinds of other technologies like in artificial intelligence, um, and all kinds of genome editing uh, technologies, and, and of course genetically modified uh, um, genetic modification. So, um, so what happens is that few stem cells are taken from uh, cows, pigs, and chickens, or fish, and uh, they're, they're usually taken from the slaughterhouse. Uh, usually it's better if the animal is young, so the cells are more, have more vitality. Uh, and it's grown, these cells are then grown in a rich tissue culture medium. Um, and, they're, and, then, and then in this tissue culture medium, they're allowed to proliferate and to differentiate into muscle tissue. So the growth medium is very important because that's where all the cellular components uh, reside in order for the uh, tissue to differentiate as muscle tissue, which is what most meat actually is. So the thing about um, the, the growth of these cells is to mimic more or less what happens during embryogenesis or during trauma. So when a, whenever a muscle is cut or severed, it, the body will go in some kind of regenerative uh, process, and that's what the uh, growth of the muscle tissue is supposed to replicate. And so all the cellular factors that are used to grow these uh, pieces of tissue actually, for the most part, come from animals. So we're not quite in the, um, in the realm of having animal-free animal products. Um, so in the case of um, uh, in vitro meat, to go back to this slide, uh, the idea is to produce animal products without animals. So to produce eggs, milk, meat, and more. And when I say more, I mean uh, rhinoceros horns, uh, leather, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, and the idea is to also disrupt uh, intensive animal farming. Um, and the idea of, cellular, of in vitro meat, excuse me, uh, is also that to start from the cell. So in terms of cellular agriculture, how much is that? Five minutes, ooh. Okay, <laughs> I'm just starting. Um, so cellular agriculture, the idea is that, you know, uh, conventional agriculture has it all wrong. You start with an animal, it's very inefficient, and you end up with meat. The best way to begin is with a cell. So the cell is the production unit of cellular agriculture, and, uh, and that's, where, uh, that's where you can start producing things and then, um, and then engineering things. So there's two types of cellular agricultures. There's the one that is the stem cell meat, which is traditional tissue culture in the laboratory. And then there's the acellular uh, cellular agriculture, which involves uh, bioengineered yeast in a big fermentation uh, system. So the sort of dairy products are more uh, using the engineering side of cellular agriculture, whereas the meat side is obviously the tissue culture itself. Just very quickly, some of the claims that the industry is making, um, they want to replace traditional meat, they want to disrupt uh, the food system, that's something that they keep repeating. Uh, they believe in a future where animal products are animal free, I'm not sure what that means, if that makes any sense. 
Uh, Pat Brown, CEO and founder of Impossible Foods. If you've all heard of the Impossible Burger, it's that plant burger that bleeds because it contains uh, leg hemoglobin from soy, from genetically modified soy, so it's made to look and feel like real meat. Um, he says, we can continue to improve our meatless products now until forever, and the cow is not going to get any better at being meat. So the idea is that we can do it better. We can do it better than the cow. And this actually says it all to me. I don't know if you can read it. I will read it for you. This is from a company, a Dutch company called Meatable. Uh, and it says, one cell can change everything. And what they, it says is that Meatable makes 100% real, delicious, guilt-free meat. With one cell, we can revolutionize the meat industry's impact on climate change and animal welfare. At the same time, we increase food security without compromising the culinary experience of eating tasty, real meat. This innovation is essential for our planet and for improving human lives. Nothing more. <laughs> That's it. It's going to solve all our problems. So it's, these are the kind of claims. So the other claims are, are the creation of what they call a post-animal bioeconomy. So what is a post-animal bioeconomy? It's the idea that you can produce these products without the animal. So you get rid of the animal, which is sort of like the inefficient part of industrial agriculture. Because animals, they get sick. Sometimes they don't want to work. Uh, you know, things happen, their bodies aren't all the same. Uh, and so it's better if you can have a system that you can control from, from the cellular level. Uh, so the idea of post-animal is highly problematic. As you can imagine, what is a post-animal? It's sort of reminiscent of a post-human, this idea that you can live outside your body, you can upload your brain to some other uh, material <laughs> platform. Uh, and this idea also that we're talking about mass animal liberation. Not sure what that exactly entails, because they never talk about this. But the issue here is that we are still committed to eating meat. Uh, so the commitment of the Western diet towards meat is still there, as it is with milk products uh, and other products, like uh, eggs, for example. So we're still carnivores. So they're not really disrupting anything. In fact, I would say that um, in vitro meat represents um, a kind of uh, a, a higher level of industrialization of agriculture. It's kind of like the synthesis, uh, the, the, the evolution that's been started in the 19th century in, when the people started you know, hybridizing um, animals and, and worked on animal genetics and better, better ways of slaughtering, etc., etc. So these are some of the startups. Um, that are, on, that, are, that are out there, that are, start, that are stating that they are making um, edible meat products and that we should have them by 2021. They keep pushing the date back because at this point this is highly experimental and it's really uh, very uh, speculative. Just very quickly, my last slide because that's where my research uh, questions are. Um, what I really want to know is really uh, in terms of edible tissue economies, what values and embodied power relations are constituted in the creation and production of these tissues? Um, clearly, there's 1.3 billion people on this planet working in the meat industry in one way or another. There's 600 million people that are surviving on small-scale animal agriculture today. So what is that industry going to actually do? How do these power relations manifest themselves, not only through the production of laboratory meats, but also through their consumption? We don't know anything about these products. We've never eaten them before. So how do we make them edible? What are some of the narratives and some of the, the, the imaginaries that come into making these things edible? And how does agency circulate during our bodily engagements with these new forms of life? What are these new forms of life? What kind of ontological status do they have? Are they living? Are they dead? They're vital, but they're not really living. They don't die. They don't really live. They're kind of generic tissues. Um, so what, what exactly do they, do they represent and what are they? And finally, is meat separable from its mode of species life and being? Are animals ontologically present in meat, egg, and milk uh, if it's pr created in the laboratory? So what are we actually eating here? And does it matter that it comes from an animal? Because many people have said we could even culture our own cells. So this is the new form of cannibalism that they're talking about, where you can actually make a hamburger from your own cells. 
Um, and of course, what does it entail for human-animal relations? So if I had another hour, I would probably get into these questions, but unfortunately, I have to cut my, uh, my talk short. So I think I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to let uh, Matt uh, go on, and uh, we can talk about it some more at the discussion. Oh, I just wanted to show one last slide, because uh, I always talk about the cow as being prehistoric technology. Um, <laughs> so this is old technology. This is new technology, so just remember that. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much.